Hello, this is uh, chapter three, and this will be the first lecture. And I made this lecture too long, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. Lecture one, part one, lecture one, part two, and this will be lecture one, part one. And this chapter is about the basic economic model that we have for markets. And uh, markets are the main purpose, or the main study, I should say, of microeconomics. And markets are anything which brings buyers and sellers together. It makes exchange easier. It facilitates exchange. So markets could be as simple as a roadside stand, which is selling strawberries, uh, oranges. Markets could be the local grocery store. Uh, it could be a 7-Eleven. Markets could be uh, global in nature. It could be the stock market. It could be uh, currency markets, Bitcoin markets. So markets are all over the place and anywhere the buyers and sellers get together, uh, markets are there. Now, markets, uh, markets can come in different structures, and in this class we'll cover four different kinds of market structures. We have uh, chapters uh, uh, later on on these, on these market structures, and, but in chapter three, we're going to assume that the markets we're looking at are what economists call competitive markets. Again, there's a whole chapter later on on competitive markets, and we'll go into that in, in, in competitive markets in a lot more detail. But in the meantime, let's just uh, briefly go over some of the main characteristics. These kind of markets have many buyers and sellers, so that's the lots of competition. And then each market has buyers and sellers that are similar in size, so no one really dominates the market. You can have lots of buyers, but if one person or, uh, buys 90% of whatever the market is selling, then that person uh, has the upper hand and maybe can get, get a better deal than, say, the smaller buyers. Likewise, if you're, say, say you're selling 99% of the market uh, output, then, all this, uh, then you probably have more uh, power to drive that price up than your competitors. So we're going to assume that it's not the case here. There's no one that controls the market. Everyone is similar. And everyone is also selling an identical product. So there's no way co what economists call product differentiation. Product differentiation is when you can distinguish your product from your competitors' products. In, this, in, in, these, in these markets, we're going to assume that's not the case. And that also limits uh, the ability to you, for you to charge, say, a higher price than your competitors. So everyone is selling the same kind of apples. Everyone is selling the same kind of oranges, wheat, and so forth. Uh, stock market is a good example of this, where everyone is selling uh, uh, the shares of stock, which are identical to, to everyone else's shares of stock. So again, no one here can have the upper hand. And all this means is that no one has what economists call market power. Market power is the power to control the price. These buyers and sellers here don't have that. So for example, in the stock market, if the going price of a share of stock is, say, $100 per share, and you have, say, 10 shares of, the, of this particular company's stock, and you, want to, and, and, and you want to put them on the market to sell them, and you tell your broker you want to sell them at $110, well, it's not going to happen, because why would they, anyone pay $10 more for your shares when they could buy the shares from a million, uh, from a million other, um, other customers, sellers, for $100? So you cannot get a higher price than the market price. And because you can sell your 10 shares at $100 per share, there's no reason for you to drop your price before below $100. So whatever the market says the price is, that's the price you're going to sell it, which means you are a price taker. And everyone in these markets are price takers. And you and I, most likely, are also price takers. If you want to buy a gallon of milk at a supermarket, you bring the uh, gallon of milk up to the cashier's uh, stand to uh, pay for the milk. Uh, the price uh, comes out to $5. You tell the cashier you want to pay, say, $3. It's, it's not going to happen. You know They're going to look at you kind of strange, maybe call security, ask you to leave, because you are not a price maker. Where a price maker has the power to set the price, you are a price taker. Now, you may have heard the phrase, there's, a strength, there's power in numbers, strength in numbers, and that is true. And now if we can get like maybe all of Chafee College uh, faculty, staff, students to join, which you might want to call the Chafee Milk Bond Association, and we send down our representatives down to the local supermarket, and, uh, we, have, and, and we tell them that we have like maybe you know, 20, 30,000 people, uh, uh, consumers, as, as a member of the Chafee Milk Bond Association, and then every time one of our members comes down, we'll have some kind of idea, of course, that they'll give us, say, a 50% discount on milk. 
uh, they might do that actually because now we have strength in numbers uh, and again we can tell them that if you don't give us a discount we're gonna go to some other stores you know if you and I did that they couldn't care less about a single consumer but 20 30,000 I think they would care but in these kind of markets no one has that kind of power so everyone again is a price taker and what that means is that the market sets the price you and I don't set the price the market does so again no individual buyer or seller can affect the price so if you ask on exam in a competitive market who sets who sets the price the answer is the market sets the price and the market sets the price through demand and supply so chapter three builds an economic model on demand and supply and this is the basic economic model we have to analyze markets and so we're going to go over this uh, model in chapter three and we're going to apply it uh, throughout the rest of the semester so market has two or uh, the, yeah, this model has two components we have the demand component and supply component we'll do demand first and demand right here is a this definition of it it relates the price of an item with the amount of an item that a consumer is both willing and able to buy during a particular time period willing means there's prob there needs to be some benefit you get from the item or else you would not want to pay money for it Enable means you have the ability to pay for it, which means you have the money. So demand is a relationship. It's not a number. Demand is a relationship. It's a function between two variables, price and quantity demanded. Quantity demanded is the name that economists give to this amount thing. So the amount that a consumer is willing and able to buy is a long thing to say. And so what economists have done is we came up with the term quantity demanded that describes this amount. And then when we write it on graphs or shorthand, we use price, and, uh, and Q, uh, P for price, and QD for quantity demanded. So that means that quantity demanded is a function of price. And this right here, is demand. Demand is this statement down here. So quantity demanded as a function of price is what we call demand. Demand looks at all the different possible prices and how it affects all the different quantity demanded. Since quantity demanded depends on price, quantity demanded is the, is the dependent variable and price is the independent variable. And so if price increases or decreases, that's going to change the quantity demanded. And the way they work together is through what economists call the law of demand. Now, even though we call it a law, there are some exceptions to this. So it really is a hypothesis, a theory on how price and quantity demanded relate to each other. And the law of demand is the following. It states that if the price goes up, that's going to cause the quantity demanded to go down. And if the price goes down, that's going to cause the quantity demanded to go up. This is a statement about buyer's intentions. It's not a statement about the actual amount consumers are trying to buy. It's a statement of, at this price, what would consumers do? At, th at this other price, what would consumers do? And so on and so on and so on. So it's, all, it's, it's a statement of the possibilities, all the buyer's intentions. The actual amount that we're buying is going to be the quantity demanded. Now, the buyer's intentions are driven by their th a thing called the willingness to pay. In your book, they call this the WTP. And that tells us the most someone is willing to pay to purchase a good or service. This is not what you want to pay. Uh, what you want to pay, what I want to pay, is zero. Uh, I, I don't want to pay anything. So it's not what you want to pay. It's what you will you will get most to the good. And this gives us a measurement of the benefit consumers get from the good. Because money speaks. And if you want to pay, say, $10 to get a cup of coffee, then that cup, a cup of coffee is worth to you at least $10 in benefit, or else why would you be willing to pay $10? So everyone is very careful with money, and we're not going to be throwing money around uh, uh, without getting something in return. And so, willingness to pay is a measurement, again, of the highest price you're willing to pay to get a particular good. Now, down here, again, this is the law of demand. And the law of demand, as I said above, is the lower the price, 
the larger the quantity demanded and the higher the price, the smaller the quantity demanded. So again, I can write it like this as shorthand. So if the price goes down, this causes the quantity demanded to go up. And if the price goes up, this causes the quantity demanded to go down. And this is only true if other, uh, if other variables don't change. And that is the Catter's Paribus condition that we talked about in Chapter 1, Math Review. Catter's Paribus, again, is a Latin term that means other variables don't change. And so if the price goes down, we're assuming other variables that could affect how much you would buy is not going to change. For example, if this is the price of apples and the price of apples go down, uh, this says we're going to buy more apples, but that would not be the case if other factors could change. Say, for example, the price of apples go down, but you lose your job, so you can't afford to buy apples, in which case, which, in which case you buy less apples, not more. Or the price of apples go down, but other fruit goes down even more in price. So uh, apples go down by uh, maybe five cents a pound, and bananas go down by 50 cents a pound, oranges go down by a dollar a pound, and so on. So even though apples are going down in price, you still would not buy more apples because other factors have changed, which have made apples less attractive. So whenever we look at uh, demand or supply for that matter, and we're going to be changing the price, this condition has to hold. The law of demand works pretty well if this condition holds. If this condition does not hold, then over here we have no, no idea what's going on. If you tell me, uh, Professor McMurrin, if the price goes down uh, for apples, would people buy more apples? And I would say yes, provided nothing else changes. If you tell me the price goes down and all these other factors could change, would people buy more apples if the price of apples went down? The answer is I have no idea. Because so many other factors can cause people to buy less apples, not more apples, even if the price of apples have gone down. So I'll stop there and we'll come back for part two by looking at an example of demand down here with this table and this graph.